This is the fourth in a series of messages which are designed to give you an overview of the Holy Bible. In the first message, we sought to give you a lot of interesting facts about the Bible, hoping to whet your appetite to actually get you into reading the Bible for yourself. In the second lesson, we showed you that Jesus Christ was the central character of the Bible. And in the third lesson, Jesus, as the author of the Bible, divided the Bible into two great sections. He said that to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength was the first and most important commandment that God had ever given in the Bible. The second commandment, similar to it, was that we were to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, he spoke those words specifically regarding Genesis through Malachi, but I think the general truth applies also to Matthew through Revelation, so that all of the 66 books of our Bible can be briefly summarized in only two commandments. The first, the first involves a vertical relationship causing us to have a right relationship with God. The second involves a horizontal relationship, encouraging us to have a right relationship with our neighbor. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, we have used the globe as an illustration, saying that for thousands of years, men walked upon various continents of the earth trying to get some kind of a perspective but they really did not have a proper view of the earth with its continents and its oceans. And when Christopher Columbus believed that the world was round, he was indeed a radical in his day. And what we're trying to do now is not to give you an in-depth view of any particular passage of Scripture, but an overview, encouraging you to read the Bible for yourself and believing that when you do, God is going to work a great blessing in your life. Today's lesson is going to involve the purpose behind God's commandments. Now, I want to begin by saying that we have a God who is without variation or shadow cast by turning. That truth is stated in James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness or variation, neither shadow which is cast by turning. You change, I change, the weather changes, but God never changes. This truth is also stated in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. It's stated about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And I think generally speaking, most people who are familiar with the Bible at all will acknowledge the fact that God is without variation or shadow cast by turning. Now the next thing which I want to point out, which is equally important, is that the plans of God never change. That may be, may be more difficult to communicate, and so I want to give you a series of scriptures which prove that. We believe that God is omnipotent, which means he is all-powerful. We believe that God is omnipresent, which means that he is everywhere at the same time. But we also believe that God is omniscient, which means he is all-knowing. The reason why we change our minds or change our plans is because we run into some, something that we did not anticipate. And of course, God who knows all things never has had that experience. So before the foundation of the world, he knew exactly what he wanted and how he wanted to accomplish it. And the Bible is a revelation of God's will to man. The first scripture that I want to call to your attention is found in the 16th chapter of the book of Romans. I will read a series of scriptures and they will use the word mystery. This is the Greek word musterion, and it refers to something which was previously not known, but now has been revealed. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 25, the scriptures read like this, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now you see that the mystery of God at one time was not made known, now it is made known, and it was conceived in the mind of God before the world began. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we find the word mystery again, beginning with verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, 
neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. Now, this passage again teaches that there is a mystery which at one time was not made known, but now has been revealed, and that this mystery was conceived in the mind of God before the world unto our glory. The same truth is stated in the third chapter of the book of Ephesians. Beginning with verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he tells them that the mystery at one time was not made known, but it had been revealed to him, and when you read the Ephesian letter, or when you read the Word of God, you will have the knowledge of the mystery which God is now revealing. Skipping down to verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places may be, might be known by the church the manifold, or that means many-sided, the many-sided wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the mystery of God is an eternal purpose which God ordained before the foundation of the world. The same truth is also stated in the book of Colossians and the first chapter. Verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, again, the same truth that there was a mystery which God conceived before the world, which he is now in the process of revealing by his holy inspired prophets. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. At the risk of wearing you out, let me mention Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we are told that we are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, which we can inherit from our fathers, but we are redeemed with the incorruptible, the precious blood of Jesus, like a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. Now, if God doesn't change, and he doesn't, and if the plans of God do not change, and they don't, then we may safely assume that God has always wanted the same thing. But those of you who have begun your study of the Bible will say, now wait a minute, I was reading in the book of Leviticus some of the commandments which God gave to Moses, and that's entirely different from what he gives to us in the church. So because there are different commandments, you may wrongly assume that God has changed his mind and wants something different. The simple explanation to this matter is realized by the fact that the commandments of God are not ends in themselves, they are rather means to an end. Let me give you a very simple illustration. You may have several children in your home, we do, we have five children, and we have frequently given our children commandments because we wanted them to do things, but the commandments which we give our children are not ends in themselves, they are means to an end. Suppose two of my boys were having a fight and I commanded them to stand in the corner. Did I want them to stand in the corner or not? Well, of course I wanted them to stand in the corner. I wouldn't have told them to. But that was not my ultimate goal or design for their life. I told them to stand in the corner so that they might learn to get along with one another, so that they might learn to love one another. And this is essentially the reason why God has given commandments in the Bible. Not that the commandments are ends in themselves, but the commandments of God are means to an end. And this is stated explicitly in 1 Peter, or excuse me, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Timothy was left at Ephesus to correct a problem. The church had gotten off of the straight and narrow way, and they had a lot of people arguing. Let me begin with verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest, mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, 
Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment, that means the reason why the command, commandment was given. The goal or purpose of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So the commandments of God are not ends in themselves, but they are means to an end. And Jesus said that the law and the prophets could be briefly summarized in two great commandments. The first involved loving God in the right way. The second involved loving our neighbor in the right way. And all the commandments which God gave to Moses can be briefly comprehended in these two simple commandments. The ultimate goal of God in our lives is love. Now let me give you other passages of Scripture which teach this. Paul was writing to the congregation at Rome, and in the 13th chapter of the Roman letter in verse 8, he said, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now I like to pay my debts, I presume you like to pay yours. But this is a debt that we will never completely pay. Owe no man anything but love, and we always have a debt of love to pay. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of of the law. In the Galatian letter, we read essentially the same truth. The Galatians were distinguished, among other things, by the fact that not one word of commendation is given to the Galatians. They had started out in the right way, and yet someone had come in there with a legalistic approach to God, which had made them forget all the beautiful lessons about love, which the Holy Spirit had been teaching them through the inspired Apostle Paul. So in Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul said this, Brethren, we have been called unto liberty, this is verse 13, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Right now this passage is filled with meaning, but let me just briefly say that when we become a Christian, a great struggle takes place within our lives. The Holy Spirit is trying to produce love in our lives, and the flesh is trying to produce something else. And these are opposed or contrary the one to the other. The word opposed is used in Luke chapter 21 to refer to warring armies. One was entrenched outside the city of Jerusalem trying to destroy it, and the sustained conflict lasted for several years. And it's that way in our lives. The Holy Spirit comes into our life trying to get us to love, but the flesh wants us not to love, and these are contrary the one to the other. In the uh, letter of James which was one of the earliest letters to be written, there is a, another very beautiful passage about love. Now, James talks about discrimination in the church and said when somebody comes into your congregation with a gold ring and goodly apparel, there's ever the temptation to offer him a very prestigious place. If a slave comes in in vile raiment, you always have the temptation to not pay very much attention to him. And so the Bible says if you do that, you become judges of evil thoughts, and you're convicted of the law as transgressors. And then in the eighth verse, James talks about a royal law, which is the law of love. If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons and commit sin, you are convicted of the law as transgressors, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point he is guilty of it all. Well, let's briefly review. Now we have a God who never changes, and we have a God whose plan never changes. 
and the fact that at sundry times and in divers manners he has given different kinds of commandments is simply an indication that he has been trying to do the same thing in a different way. Back in the sixth chapter of the book of Leviticus, we have the law of the trespass offering. Let me read. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor, in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or hath found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely in any of these things that a man doeth sinning therein, then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or that which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found, or that about which he had sworn falsely. He shall even restore it, the principal, and add the fifth part more thereunto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of the trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish, out of the flock, with the estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and, he should, and it shall be forgiven him for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. Right now, here we have a situation where a man was commanded, if he had done something wrong, to take a trespass offering to the Lord, and also he was penalized by having to pay his offended brother a 20% fine, or adding the fifth part thereunto. Now, Jesus said that the law and the prophets could be summarized in two commandments. One, you have to have a right relationship with God, and two, you have to have a right relationship with your neighbor. And we've tried to point out that the commandments of God are not an end in themselves, they are a means to an end, just as you as a loving parent might command your children to stand in the corner. Not that that was the ultimate aim uh, in your thinking for their lives, but it was only a means to teach them something. So God had the ultimate aim of wanting his people to love him. And during the age of Moses, he commanded them to take something very precious, an animal, or grain, or oil, and to give it away, to pour it out, and a sacrifice before the Lord. Not that God really enjoyed seeing blood drip down an altar or grain or oil wasted, but he was trying to teach us to reverence him and to put him first in our lives. And the fact when we did something wrong, we had to pay our brother back not only what we had taken, but also a 20% fine. That was to teach us that we needed to get along with our brother. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother hath ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go your way, and first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. When Jesus was upon the earth, he frequently did things which the religious elite of his day couldn't understand. Upon one occasion, he healed a man with a withered hand in a synagogue. On another time, he walked through the grain fields on the Sabbath day, and uh, he ate on the Sabbath day. They couldn't understand that. And they said that Jesus was violating the plan of God for mankind. And Jesus kept saying, go back and read again the prophets. You have misunderstood the purpose of God. The Sabbath day was made for man, not man for the Sabbath day. One passage which Jesus referred to was found in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. It reads like this, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now it is true God commanded the burnt offerings, and God commanded the sacrifices, but it's also true that I commanded my children to stand in the corner, we'll say. But my ultimate design in their life was not standing in the corner. And the ultimate desire of God in the lives of his people was never just to make animal sacrifices. It was never just to go to the temple and go through the rituals of religion. It was always something beyond that. The end of the commandment, the goal of the commandment was love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. In the sixth chapter of the book of Micah, we find a similar truth. Let's begin reading with verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Now it's true that God commanded burnt offerings. It's true that God commanded them to bring their yearling calves to him. And Micah the prophet is saying, is that really what God wants? If it is, then will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? 
if slaying one ram pleases God, let's slay a thousand rams, if that's what God wants. Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil, if pouring out a small amount of oil will please God, let's give him a river of oil. But Micah knew this was really not the ultimate desire of God for his people, so he continued. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? In the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew is perhaps the most scathing denunciation that Jesus delivered while he was in the flesh. It was to the religious aristocracy of the day, to people who were reading the Bible all the time, but who had missed the point about love. And Jesus said, you pay your tithes of mint, anise, and cumin. They went out in the garden, got even the small little garden herbs, and were certain to give God his tenth because they wanted to make God happy. They wanted to please God but they had missed the major point of biblical teaching. They had missed the doctrine of love. So Jesus said, you have omitted the weightier matters. And the weightier matters involve mercy and love. You know, there's ever the danger, as you think about this, that it's just something academic. Well, it's a very interesting lesson, you say, but what relevance does it have in my life? Let me share with you an article which came out in news magazine some time ago. It's written by Larry Parker about an experience involving his family, and in the article is titled, I Watched My Son Die. I'm writing this testimony with the hope and prayer that somehow I can share with you a lesson that I have learned at great expense. It is only by the grace of God and the never-failing all-encompassing love of Jesus Christ our Lord that my wife and I have been able to come through this trial. We took our diabetic son Wesley forward in our church to be prayed for according to James 5.14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Subsequently, we believe that faith for his healing required that we not give him any more medicine. We decided to stand on the scripture in Isaiah 53, 5 and 1 Peter 2, 14, by whose stripes you were healed, by Jesus' stripes. After three days of prayer, fasting, and great suffering, physically on our son's part and mental anguish on our part, Wesley died. His parents were charged with manslaughter and felony child abuse. And after the trial was over, they looked back upon this experience and began to learn some lessons, the lessons that we are trying to teach you in this series, giving you an overview of the Bible. And one major lesson which this fine Christian man, and I refer to him as a fine Christian man, even though he made what he admits to be a tragic mistake. One of the lessons which he learned was a lesson in priorities. Faith is important, but the Bible teaches that love is more important than faith. Remember the lesson in 1 Corinthians 13? Now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Let me continue quoting from the article. In Matthew 9, 12, and 13, right after the Lord says, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, he asks that the Pharisees learn what this means when he said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He repeats the same words in Matthew 12, 7, when he reminds the Pharisees, but if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy, or compassion, and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. Can you see it now? In withholding medicine from Wesley after he was prayed for, my wife and I were offering up a sacrifice, a very difficult one of faith. But in so doing, we condemned the guiltless, our own son, to an early grave. We did the very same thing that the Pharisees were doing when Jesus condemned them. We were applying scripture without the important measurement of love. 
we offered up sacrifice without mercy, just the opposite of what our Lord wanted. Through our experience, we have learned that medicine is good, like other good things God has given us, but it can be abused. Certainly, we can see that to withhold good is evil. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 reads, Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. I don't really know how to explain faith or why some people are healed and others are not. I do, not, I do know that Jesus does heal and that he does love us and that he died for us and rose again that we might be saved. I do know that one day I will see my son again in heaven. Through my tragic error, I have learned that in all areas of life, the measurement for action is love, and that all the commandments of God hang on love. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy heart, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.